you as having this amazing, oh, recording, uh, this awesome panel discussion with you all. Um, and one part of community engagement is engaging with the community like yourselves. Um, and so partnering with uh, people out in the community um, and really helping to support them, especially in this COVID um, pandemic. So um, working with uh, partners like yourselves is really key to getting the vaccine out, getting information, accurate information out there, um, and really helping to, uh, to help people understand um, the efficiency and the, and the, um, the safety that the COVID vaccines bring. So um, I heard about this event uh, uh, from George and I figured I'd bring my colleague on board as well. Um, and I will turn it over to Matt um, and uh, he, we've done some um, amazing presentations um, and he uh, does a great job as far as uh, talking about kind of COVID vaccines and all that stuff. So Matt, go for it. Um, hey, thank, thank you for thanks for the kind words, Daniel. So my name is Matt Burton. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm in private practice in downtown Tacoma. And I came on with the health department halftime starting in March of 2020. Through most of last year, my job was to go to nursing homes and help to manage outbreaks. And I also did a lot of uh, record keeping, following up with keeping score who died a lot of the time, which was a really hard job. As we got into 2021, my job transitioned to being to leading vaccination clinics, which was such a wonderful time. It's first few months of vaccine clinics, there was a hopefulness about this uh, pandemic response. It really felt like we were getting, we turned the corner, we were getting this under control. As the numbers at the vaccine clinic started to slide, my role was transitioned to uh, getting out in the community and trying to talk to people to bring those vaccine rates up. Uh, but that's hard. And I understand there's a lot of there's a lot of hesitancy in the community, a lot of really important questions, and that's why I'm here. I'm hoping that um, I can I can talk you through them and and maybe hope hope hopefully make you folks feel better about the vaccination program. So, all right. Well, um, I I just want to give like a, a quick, if I can, a, a quick update where we are right now. Uh, in the in Pierce County, our numbers are low compared to the rest of the state. We just crossed the 65% threshold of eligible individuals, that's 12 and up, are fully vaccinated in county, 71 people have had at least half of the, the uh, program. And the numbers are going, it's funny, we went through this huge spike and then we came down to a plateau and we're, we're getting about 1% of the county getting a shot uh, per, per week right now. So you know, the numbers are still increasing, but they're increasing much slower. A couple of things have really helped us in the last week here. One is that we uh, just had age expansion. So starting this next week, that's our first full week of, accept, of access to vaccines for people five to 11. Uh, that's gonna help us get school outbreaks under control, hopefully. And we've also had some clarity around uh, vaccine booster doses, which I think will, again, drive some interest and help get people into clinics. So that's where we are now. Uh, what questions do you guys have for me? I'll tell you what, Matt, why don't we go ahead and have um, uh, others just talk about their roles a little bit and then we'll hit some questions after that. So why don't we go ahead and uh, Tamara, why don't you go ahead and explain how, how you've been involved in this, this last couple of years? <clears throat> Certainly. So when the outbreak started, I was an orthopedic uh, physician assistant, so assisting with surgeries and rounding on patients in the hospital, uh, helping to fix people who had broken bones and had arthritis. Uh, and then uh, earlier this year, I transitioned into a role where I go into skilled nursing facilities and rehab facilities and direct rehab programs uh, from the individual level for the patients to working with the therapy team to, to improve their outcomes. Um, and so I've dealt you know, pretty closely with individual patients as well as patient populations. And throughout, I've been able to volunteer at vaccine clinics, which has been an incredibly hopeful and positive experience to take part in helping to protect the community. Um, so it's, I've, I've run the gamut throughout the, the process here. Great, Marlene, why don't you go ahead and go next? 
Hi, I'm, I'm, my name's Marlene Bridgeforth and I'm a retired uh, actually uh, nurse and nurse practitioner, but um, I've been uh, blessed to be able to work with Gwen dogs and, and other folks um, with, we, we call it our building reopening committee. And basically it was to uh, implement and look at the uh, COVID federal and state guidelines to help us ensure when we reopened our church for worship and other events to do so safely um, and to minimize any type of transmission. So that was probably my primary role. I've also been um, able to uh, uh, apply and get accepted by <laughs> the MRC, the Medical Reserve Corps of Pierce County. So I have uh, been able to attend several vaccination clinics. And those have been very positive experiences. And it's maybe because they're coming and they want to get vaccinated. You're not really dealing with folks that are like, I'm not sure I want to get vaccinated. They're there because they do want to get the vaccine. So um, that's been a, a real positive event to be able to attend those. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, Gwen, how about you? Okay, and I um, am a parish nurse or was a parish nurse at the church. That's how I got started, but I'm also a retired nurse, retired just as COVID started. And I have been, um, in the beginning, I was highly involved in getting our senior citizens in the church uh, place to get the vaccine. That was the first vaccine. And then I also have been involved, uh, like Marlene said, with the reconnecting committee. And I've uh, attended and worked at um, quite a few vaccinations as well. Um, I it was really fun in the beginning because people even wanted to take your picture with them. They were so excited to get it. But then I was also involved at uh, uh, St. Joseph Hospital when it was mandatory and that and the people were coming in that really did not want vaccinated. So that was a different experience as well. And then I just wanted to put a plug in for a book um, about it was it's called the um, the great influence influenza. It's the 1918 flu and what we should have learned from it. And the author is uh, John Barry who is um, a professor at Tulane, and he compares COVID and, um, and, and the 1918 flu and what we did not learn and what we need to learn for the next one, so. Great, thank you, Gwen. And then we brought Don Hines into this panel discussion as well to talk about from a faith perspective, um, how, how are we approaching COVID-19, especially in regard to just having come off a couple of sessions talking about Matthew 25, Christianity or Christians, and how does that continue on in our participation in, uh, and involvement with um, with COVID-19. So Don, why don't you go ahead and go. You have to unmute yourself there. <clears throat> Just a second, Don, we'll have to get you unmuted. There you go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So although I am a Lutheran minister, I primarily have functioned uh, throughout most of my life as a professor of religious studies. And uh, recently in the last couple of months, I've gotten involved in this whole issue of why uh, some people are requesting religious exemptions from uh, getting vaccinated. And in particular, a friend of mine uh, back east has his kids in a Christian school, uh, an evangelical Christian school, and the so-called teaching pastor issued a statement about why he thought everybody in the congregation should refuse vaccination, but uh, he didn't do a very good 
good job of saying exactly why, except that it seemed to him to be some kind of a contest between the church and the state. So I spent uh, several hours of uh, study of this question, and this is what I think is going on. Uh, first of all, I should say the courts in general have refused to honor religious exemptions. Uh, mainline contribute, uh, mainline uh, Christian groups in the Protestant world and Catholicism have made it clear that they do not support a religious exemption. So a Catholic priest who was signing off on an exemption got in trouble with his bishop because it is not the position of the Catholic Church to support an exemption, nor Lutherans, nor Methodists, nor Presbyterians. Uh, so it's mostly been uh, evangelicals on the right. And this is the issue that I came to see. Uh, evangelical Christianity, the so-called Christian right in the United States, sees the family as the bastion of religious freedom and the secular government as the risk to religious freedom. And so almost anything that the secular government requires these people on principle are inclined to object, it, uh, object to it as a way of the family exercising its muscles over against the state. Now, even though they haven't been winning in the courts, um, they're winning in the climate of public opinion uh, so 80% of these people were voted for Trump in the last election, and um, they simply see a government incursion on the, on, on the autonomy of the family as a risk of the government taking over and making people do eventually something that would be directly against Christianity. They now agree, the, 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 the thoughtful ones of them, they now agree that the government is not asking people to do something against the Christian faith, but they want to keep their muscles exercised in case the government should get to that. Right now, it's just in principle that they're objecting, even though they can't point to anything about exemptions that is anti-Christian. So that's sort of where it's at. Maybe that leads us then to a discussion on what other reasons would people choose not to be vaccinated? So from our panel, and sometimes it's been in the, the, the clinic area or in others that you've seen people that aren't excited about that. Uh, what other reasons are people choosing not to be vaccinated? Well, I can start with, with a couple reasons. Um, Sometimes people just believe that, um, you know, when you're like 20 years old, you think you're going to live forever. It, it's the same type of thing that you think that, well, I'm really pretty healthy. I, I, other people may get COVID, but I probably won't get COVID because, you know, I'm workout, I eat right, I exercise. So the chances of me giving, getting COVID are not very great. So why should I do it? So um, sometimes it's just a, a feeling that um, they're immune. And I think one of the things that the, has been helpful with the news is when they actually do show um, people who have been kind of in prime health <laughs> that have gotten COVID. And it's like, why in the world did I get COVID? But they did. Um, so, but that's just, I don't know if that's human nature or, or what, but you know, people don't want to think that something bad is gonna to happen to them. 
And a couple of people that um, I've been involved with that were against vaccinations, it's the long-term effect that they're afraid of. They don't think that we've had long enough to see what's gonna happen um, in the end. And um, so, um, but when I was reading all these questions and stuff, one of the things that I was concerned about is relating it to Matthew 25, how we can take care of other people. And this is how I approach them, even if they don't think they're gonna get it um, or are gonna die from it, we have a responsibility to take care of those that are more vulnerable. That's a good point. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, 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 oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, that's, that's a really good point because um, you'll hear, hear these people that say, why, why should I do that for, for my family and for me? It's, it's not for me. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to do it. And, and it, it, they've totally lost the message of love thy neighbor. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, you can say, <laughs> you can say that to them, but I'm not sure that they will listen to that. Unfortunately, I don't know how to get them to change their mind. Well, and, and I looked up a lot of statistics at well, and 59% of the cases come from people who do not have uh, symptoms at the time. So that's, that's a huge percent, 24% from people who never developed symptoms at the time. So we talk about younger people not being able to get it, but they are very, very, uh, they were spreaders and, and we need to convince them to, or educate them on um, taking care of other people. I learned a new thing this afternoon. My five-year-old is scheduled for COVID test, or I mean a COVID vaccine. And she was told by her preschool that she would need to quarantine for a week afterwards because oh. this woman who runs the preschool um, is an anti-vaxxer and is afraid that if you get the shot, you're going to get COVID. So that's a new one for me. I haven't heard that one, yeah. Matt or Daniel, do you have a response to that as to what we've, kind of- We've heard it, we've heard it. Heard it. So, you know, the broader question of, of where does hesitancy come from? There are really two broad categories that I see drive most of it. The one that I was expecting that hasn't panned out is needle phobia, but the two that are, I think are very important are trust and control or uh, sort of rebellion against the sense of control. And I find that most of the conversations I have, especially when there are folks from the evangelical community, it's this question about government control. And when you're talking to somebody who's coming from that place, questions about community or points about community are just not very compelling. Yeah, I've been really surprised. I have an adult disabled daughter who's very high risk. And I've been very surprised by how little that influences people when I talk about it. And I think that's really- Yeah, I think, I, I, I think from a Christian point of view, and we are a country in which there are significant percentages of uh, people who, who are related to the church. And one would have thought, not just because of the recent emphasis on Matthew 25, in as much as you did to the least of these, you did it unto me. Even apart from that, everybody thought they knew, every pastor thought they knew that the essence of Christianity is concern for the neighbor. And yet this doesn't seem to have much influence. And uh, when, you, when you can't think of anything else to say, and you say, yeah, never mind whether, whether you're gonna get it or not, what are you thinking about the fact that you need to make society safer for everyone else? That argument doesn't work. Gwen, when you were reading that book that you brought up, was it dealt with differently or were you seeing similar responses? It, it was very um, similar. Um, he, the one thing that he said, the final lesson was that number one thing you have to trust, you had, the government has to be totally honest 
right up front. That didn't happen in 1918 and it didn't happen with COVID. So that's why people won't trust the vaccine as well because they haven't been told the truth all along. Um, and then um, and then he also talked about um, um, that, I was looking for exactly where I wrote, I wrote a whole bunch of stout, but um, oh, he says the way to do that is to dis Distort nothing, to put the best face in nothing, to try to, to try nothing to manipulate people. And then he also goes on to say the most important thing is social distancing. Now, yeah. maybe, maybe Matt and Daniel, you can talk about, since it was really kind of unknown how this response was, um, and has that kind of affected how we're, how we're taking it? Sorry, I don't know if I understand the question. Uh, I think you know, it's even that there have been a lot of changes into how to, to deal with uh, the COVID-19. Um, and does that, how does that play into this lack of trust? I don't know. It's, this is a hard one, right? I, I read a list on the social media a couple of days ago of all the things public health got wrong since the beginning. And most of the things on there I didn't think were wrong. You've been fairly consistent from the start, right? Avoid large gatherings, use masks when indoors, um, uh, closing nursing homes to visitors. You know, these real basic public health uh, uh, tenets of prevention have been remarkably consistent from the start. What's not been consistent is the way that the public uses those. And I think it's, it's frustrating that you know, we've been, both been blamed and vilified in public health. But really, the, the numbers in communities really reflect the behaviors of the people in the community. You know, Seattle has been very good compared to national averages in case numbers and deaths, even though we were one of the first places that had COVID show up, because I think the population here is fairly careful. But there are parts of the country that have three times the case rate and up to, I think, five times the death rate that we have here. And I think it speaks to the culture here that maybe our trust is a little higher, but it's frustrating to see so much vilification of just basic public health outreach. And I think that's been to the detriment of our response. And, you know, science changes. I guess that's the other thing that maybe because I'm in health have worked my career in healthcare, I understand that. I mean, uh, we used to think estrogen was good for heart disease, for example. And um, this is something that's brand new and we don't know and the science will change. And people don't like those types of situations. They want, this is the answer and this is what we're gonna do and it will be fine. And that's not the way that it is. That's right. Marlena, really, I think that's really a super good criticize. point. Go ahead, Matt. I just want to make the point, it's really easy to criticize. And the, the people I work with at the health department who are making these decisions at the population level, we're up reading nights and weekends. We're working on Sundays. We're, we're, we're working as hard as we can to be on top of this. And you know, again, things do change. And we're not doing this to punish people. Not doing it because right. we want control. We're doing it because we care. Yeah. Camera, you had something to add there. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Marlene, I really appreciate that that point. And Matt, I appreciate yours too. It's it's super frustrating to see, you know, all my colleagues in public health and at the research institute and and in the trenches working so very hard, putting themselves at risk, um, working long hours, and then being vilified, as you say, and, and seeing all branches of the media skewing things in order to get, you know, the, the grabbiest headline, rather than continuing the public health message to educate. And what I'd, I'd like to tie this into a little bit through some of my experiences is that if we approach a lot of folks who are hesitant or even adamantly against vaccine with the idea that they're, that, that they're deserving of compassion uh, and that we have some curiosity as to how they got to that place, 
we're much more likely to have at least a productive conversation but if we don't change their mind right now, perhaps they're going to be open to it in the future. Um, denial and fear are two of the most powerful human emotions, uh, and they're both at play in this situation. Um, it's it, and it's hard. It's hard not just to get angry sometimes. Um, but I think it, I've I've had a couple conversations with healthcare providers who are vaccine hesitant or against vaccines. And there, which I really didn't understand at first. And as I talked to these folks, I really found that there was a deep seated fear that was at the, at the heart of that. Um, and once you can understand that, it really makes it much easier to move forward in the conversation. What are some yeah. of those other fear points? Like, again, I, I put into these questions, I'd heard a, a quote from somebody in our community saying that there were horror stories about people who get the vaccine. Um, uh, I, I've never heard of horror stories about people getting the vaccine. Are there those kind of things that are out there that are uh, playing against us? Definitely. You know, there are people who have been told by someone that their, you know, cousin's uncle's neighbor, you know, had something horrible happen the day after they got their vaccine. And then it, it's like the game of telephone. It grows and grows and changes as it goes through different people. Um, and then there are also folks who perhaps are part of a population, especially people of color, that has quite literally been experimented upon in the past. Uh, and there is a genuine and, and well-founded distrust of not only the government, but the medical establishment. So, you know, we, we need to be cognizant that not everyone has had good experiences with healthcare. That goes back to what we think about trust. You know, mm -hmm. if you can get them to a provider that they trust, that's the best thing because if they have a relationship, but if they don't, then that's tough. There's right. so much misinformation on the internet between, I don't know, microchips that were being, yeah. you know, uh, I don't know. There's just 10 million things it seems like that aren't true. And, and once they start getting spread on the Facebook or whatever, Twitter or Instagram, that just kind of snowballs. And um, so I think that's, I, I know you're supposed to have good leadership <laughs> to, to prevent that type of thing from happening. But boy, I tell you, with social media, it's pretty hard to, to intervene in that arena. And, and let's acknowledge that, that horror stories can be real, right? I think that last I counted, there have been 14 people that have died as a result of the vaccination, all from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 13 of them from stroke, one from a thing called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And one of them was in King County, so many locals. So this is, you know, this is important also, but at the time I did that review, I also counted, we, we lose about 14, those same 14 people every three minutes from COVID. So the magnitude is very different, but, but, it's not, but there is a small amount of risk we all took on to participate in this program. I also wanna to speak to something that George said earlier that I don't wanna let get away. There's this perception that there's a long-term side effect concern with vaccinations. We have a history of vaccines that goes back 250 years. It really isn't such a thing as a long-term side effect. The side effects of vaccines are generally visible and extant by two weeks after the vaccination occurs. And you know, we're a year into this program. If there was something we didn't see it. Yeah. Did we work together at a clinic, Marlene? I think I've met you. Before. I think so, yeah. <laughs> high school. I think, I think it was I, high schoolers. Yeah. I got a grown-up haircut again. I didn't get a haircut all last year. <laughs> Basketball. We had an interesting experience tonight in Ocean Shores going out to dinner. I'm, this is never, I've never seen this happen before. But a couple just ahead of us, uh, we went into a, a little restaurant to have dinner. And I noticed as they were walking in, they didn't have masks on. And so the young man, the host said, uh, you'll have to wear a mask. And he handed, he had a package of masks and he was, he handed the mask to them. 
the guy said, I don't do that. And I won't give my money to an establishment that requires masks. And out the door they went. I've never seen that happen before. So it was very interesting. The young man was, and, I, and when he took us to our table, I said, thank you for that. Because I'm sure they get a lot of abuse. Uh, but he handled it very, very well, but I had never seen anybody just blatantly refuse to wear a mask when asked to do so. That kind you of know, brings us back to what Tamara was talking about earlier. Maybe we can discuss that. What are some approaches to talking to people that, that if we're in those conversations or uh, have that as an opportunity, um, how, how should we approach them? I think one of the first things we need to do is listen to them, listen with compassion, listen with care. And then instead of trying to convince them anything, just educate them. I had that experience at a gal in fish with that, I, that I volunteered with, and she ended up getting the vaccine. But, you know, we, first you have to listen to them where they're at. You can't just bulldoze over them. I'll add to that. I would. I wanted. To, I wanted to say that uh, for my wife's birthday, we went to Honolulu, and we were there for a week. And every single restaurant, even the cheapest restaurant, required you uh -huh. to show your vaccination um, dem uh, proof. And then in addition, they gave you a number which you took to your table so that they could track anything necessary of other people, including the wait staff who came in contact with that table. In a week, we never saw a single person uh, protest, even though it was far uh, more strict anywhere in Washington or California. And that told me that if you set it up that this is just the way it's going to be, then possibly people are more willing to accept. Now, maybe they only accepted because they had come away to Hawaii and they were willing to play the game. Although surely not all of them were, were tourists. But another thing, uh, so I live on Key Peninsula, and you can draw a line from Key Peninsula to Gig Harbor, to Tacoma, to Seattle. And as that list goes up towards Seattle, you have fewer and fewer complaints. And as it goes down to Key Peninsula, where it's sort of every man for itself, and you don't have the same sense of, hey, we all have to do this for each other, there's much more a sense of it's every person for himself, and you can't seem to break through it. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we, we, we yeah. underestimate how important it is to people to not be told what to do. We underestimate that response in our peril, right? Don't tell me what to do has been a really important stopping point in this entire pandemic response. And I'll encourage all of you not to, you don't have to take abuse. If somebody is, you know, wants to come into the church or wants to come into a business where you are and they're evading the local laws around masking, then you can, I don't think that you're not being a good neighbor by sticking up for yourself and pushing back. But I'll also, remind you that a lot of us, are, a lot of people are really sick of this and they're really up against it and they're scared and they're angry and they are acting out almost in the same way a teenager would. Well, and unfortunately- Yeah, well, the Democrats just lost- Yeah, I was gonna say the Democrats just lost Virginia because in Virginia is, uh, is they're not uh, bohunks pretty well educated state, the people they interviewed said they were sick and tired of school systems and public health telling them what to do. And so they uh, deserted the Democratic Party that they associated with that. 
And I think our, unfortunately, between our, our news is so polarized between MSN and CNN and Fox, um, you, you get these different tribes and, and people are just, it's kind of like their allegiance is to this football team, the allegiance is to this point of view. And so that they don't want to hear. Um, and that's the first barrier to get over is to, you know, maybe is show compassion or show empathy or, or whatever to get them to actually talk about what, what it is that they actually think. And then you maybe can have a conversation, but I don't think that our news business these days is very helpful to um, trying to get us to understand what's what's actually going on in in, in the COVID world. I, I, it's just too polarized and it's too, um, they take just nuggets and just this point or that point and emphasize it and you don't get the real picture. The, the best state by far in the United States in managing the COVID epidemic or managing the vaccination rollout isn't a state at all, it's Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's vaccination rate is, is probably cross 90% of um, eligible people in the last day or two. It was 89 last I checked. And the reason for that very likely is that Puerto Rico took the vaccination program out of the hands of politics and gave it to their National Guard. And as such, there is no equivalent polarization of the population into pro and anti. Uh, and it's, it's been really remarkable to watch. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico has fewer COVID cases than Pierce County by about three times, yet has three times the population of Pierce County, which suggests about nine times fewer cases. You know, this is, this is what we could have and in, in retrospect should have done. Interesting. I have a question about public health. Um, it seems to me that our current U.S. population has forgotten what public health is all about. And that I, I frequently thought that oh. it, it, there should be room in the news to do kind of a recap on why our country even has a Department of Public Health and how it works and what its benefits have been over the years. Because I'm I'm old enough to remember, um, you know, the victory that polio was. My, one of my favorite physicians was a polio patient, and um, he he wore a brace and and he was willing to talk about it. And he's in a long long term research project on it. And so that's very clear to me that vaccines have been a major part of our longevity. But um, and we were also once evangelicals. <laughs> So, but it was even before COVID, the, the polarization within the evangelical ch church was becoming more than we could handle. And that's how we've ended up Lutherans. But um, is there any chance that we could get some of the local news companies to do a special, even, even a little 15 minute bit on why we have public health? Do a lot of outreach, but we're not getting as much traction as we'd like. Okay. You know, the, the stories were overwhelmingly positive in the local news in February, March, and April. And the tenor, it just changed. It just changed. It's frustrating. Maybe let's, let's shift, shift a little bit. Can I, talk can I ask a question, uh, uh, George? Uh, do you think that it changed because of the mandates? I think the mandates, I, I don't want to get too deep into politics here, but I think it's pretty clear that the mandates made everybody choose sides. Mm. And I'll say that the minute the mandate, the first of the mandates were announced, I started being very worried for my own personal safety at, at vaccine clinics and events I do in the public. Mm. But on the other hand, mandates have undoubtedly saved lives. Mandates, hey, look, mandates work to drive up numbers, right? They've, I think it's very obvious that states have done more aggressive mandates, have higher vaccine rates. It's a tool that we have, but it's a tool 
It's a tool that has backlash associated with it. What I think is interesting is how many of that there's a fair, it sounds like there's a fair number of people either who are like firemen or working or sheriffs or even healthcare people who don't want um, vaccinations, which I was just surprised at because it just seemed like it would be sort of a natural that they would want to get vaccinated. So I, I don't quite understand that unless it's just that they don't want to be told what to do. I'll tell you, it's hard for me to find somebody who's worked with COVID patients this year. Yeah. Wanting the vaccine. I yeah, showed up yeah. the day after Christmas at a seven o'clock in the morning in a parking lot to get mine. Yeah. Then it told me they had to do it in my eyeball. I'd been happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> you and me both. I walked through yeah. those ERs. We, we converted an entire orthopedic ward at Swedish into an ICU, um, something I never thought I would have seen. And, and thankfully, I was never called up as an orthopedic provider to provide direct um, COVID care to those patients. But I did provide musculoskeletal care, you know, when it was, you know, limb threatening or life threatening and watching what those poor poor souls went through um, as they suffered and died with COVID. I, I, absolutely, I would have taken that shot in my eyeball. Maybe we should spend a couple of minutes just talking about those people and also the people that are um, set apart because of it. I know Tamara's had some experience with that where you know, how, how are people dealing with having to live by themselves or not being able to see family in, uh, in times that, uh, that normally we would, we would be there. Maybe talking about some of those people for a bit. Um, I'd be happy to start on that. It's something I feel really passionate about. I've watched people uh, in this last year who quite likely would have recovered back to their baseline had they been able to have contact with loved ones or regular visitors. Um, they quite simply lost their will to live and, and didn't keep working with us anymore. Uh, we have also had folks who lost levels of function uh, in skilled nursing facilities because um, there is something called a restorative program that is paid for uh, by folks on Medicaid in these long-term facilities. And someone will come in and move your limbs for you and make sure you're turned enough that you don't get pressure sores. But there's no one who's gonna come spend an hour and a half with you every day to walk you up and down the hall like your mom or your sister will. But if your mom or your sister can't come in because that puts everyone else in the facility at risk for COVID and you don't walk for two months, you're never gonna walk again um, in that situation. And it's really, really hard to see these downstream consequences for people who could have had a better outcome uh, had things been handled differently if people weren't so afraid to get <laughs> their vaccines. Um, and I, w I also want, Matt, I think you brought up a really important point earlier when you said by getting the vaccines, we do take a chance. There, there is a risk with anything we put in our bodies. And even when we do get the vaccine, 95% effective means that one in 20 people will still get COVID. And some tinier percentage of those will still have serious illness. Um, so nothing that's happening right now is a panacea, um, but it, it, that circles us back to the Matthew 25 aspect of if we can think outside ourselves and look to, to care for other people, it makes a huge, huge difference. And even just the deferred care that happened last year when I was still working in surgery, um, when people started coming back for health care, um, we had to do several amputations on folks who had let their cancer go too far before they came back in. Um, so that it, they're just, it, it, it goes out and out and out the ripple effect. And it, and it I tell you, after spending a year in skilled nursing facilities and all the long-term cares, watching the, what people had to go through, not just the residents, but the employees too. To keep oh, absolutely. After watching that, when I hear people say, well, I'm not really that worried about getting COVID, 
it makes my blood boil. Yeah. Because all of those background cases in the community are going to end up in schools and they're going to end up in nursing homes. They're going to end up in that person that just had an organ transplant. Who's at Fred Meyer? That person gets sick and he or she dies. And either you care or you don't. One of the things I've been talking about lately is we really do have to get up to 85 to 90% of the population vaccinated. We get to that, the case numbers drop, they don't rise. Okay. And sometimes I'll say real bluntly to people, look, are you, are you nominating yourself to be part of the 10% who gets a free ride? And sometimes with the younger people, that's a really resonant point because I don't, I, I don't like people, I don't think people like to feel like a coward. But, but I, I sometimes, I, I'm careful with when I deploy that, but I do it sometimes. Definitely have to choose that audience very carefully. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of patients who are part of the military, so. <laughs> uh, did, George, do you want to go through this list of questions at all? I've kind of been looking at it a little bit as we're, as we're discussing. Did you see um, um, some in particular that you'd like to respond to, Matt? And yeah, a couple of them. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, one was this question about how do we know that people are dying of COVID? That's a persistent question I've heard all year. And uh, I can speak directly to that because, again, one of my jobs was, was keeping score. Is this a COVID death? Is it not a COVID death? And there are two people that review each one of those before they get recorded. One would be a person, a county coroner, or whoever does a death certificate would put that on the death certificate. And then somebody from the local health jurisdiction reviews it and decides if that is accurate, which is a systematic way to undercount. You know, we're at about 750-ish thousand deaths in, in the United States right now, but the real number is probably 900 to 950,000 that COVID has played a role in. And then if you increase, like Tamara says, and the people who had heart attacks who couldn't get care, or people who stayed at the hospital because they weren't eligible for, or they were afraid of getting COVID exposure. I think we've probably had another undefinably large number of deaths that have occurred as a result. We had a deflection upward of about a million deaths over what you'd expect during the year 2020. That's yeah, I saw they were just discussing a, a life expectancy that had dropped over two years for males in the United States and a couple of years for females as well to highlight that that point. We had a large we had a large uptick in opiate deaths last year. Is that because of COVID shutting down facilities? Yeah. So I guess mental health is a, a huge issue there too for people. Um, Well, I, Another I question of school age children, they're now saying, aren't they saying that it's a, um, a public health crisis for the um, school age children with anxiety and depression because of COVID? I want to be really careful with the way I answer that question because I've heard that point weaponized by people uh -oh. who are on, you know, very against public health uh, uh, outreach recommendations. There have not been increases in suicides this year. I know I've, I've seen a lot of news outlets suggest that's true, it's not true. Um, the increase, there hasn't been a systematic increase in medication usage for depression, but I'm talking to a lot of patients about anxiety right now. And I think that, I think it would be foolish to wipe away that that could possibly be true. Another question on this list I really want to speak to, because I think it's a smart one, is how long is this going to be around? If, if you look at historical pandemics, they usually burn out in about three years. And I think this is likely to do the same. But I think what will happen is we'll transition out of the pandemic period. We're going to go to something called the endemic period, where we have local outbreaks. And we're going to see a lot of the same things that we're doing now nationally perhaps have to be done locally in response to outbreaks. But that'll, you know, the, the vaccination rates will play a big role in how frequently that occurs. I want to make a Johnny come lightly comment uh, because it could be too late for this, but I was just imagining if I were the pastor of a church 
that had 50% Republicans and 50% Democrats, it would be foolish to preach barnstorming sermons that sounded like they came from a left-wing college professor. What you would want to do that any Christian presumably could accept is that God calls us to seek the good of the community, to seek the good of our neighbor. And maybe we've blown it on that because of course the president is a president of a 50-50 country. He's not just the pastor of a church that's 50-50. And the public health people and and uh, Dr. Fauci, all those people, if maybe from the beginning, and I don't want to be a know-it-all here, if maybe from the beginning we had said less what we're going to have to do and why people are going to just have to get vaccinated or they're going to lose their job, if we had uniformly across the land in churches and public health and in politics said, we must seek the good of the country. We must seek the good of our neighbor. We must do things so that everyone can be made safe. Maybe that boat has sailed though. And I guess that, that does bring us to a point of uh, what is our Christian and moral responsibility for other countries that aren't able to be vaccinated right now and yet we're we're passing on booster shots um yeah. that, that's something that you know we we might need to carry far forward with that's a question that the cdc spoke to directly when they uh, authorized the booster shots and the only solace i've got about that is that in the countries that don't have access to vaccines the mrna vaccines are not really tenable because of the supply chain problems that they bring. Um, so it's not like if we just didn't use the Moderna vaccines that are sitting in refrigerators in the United States, they'd magically be able to, to, to be used in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to get outreach to that group and accessibility to vaccine is not the biggest problem right now. Yeah, Phil, you have a question? You have to unmute yourself, yeah. I wonder, will we be facing kind of post-pandemic, will we be facing um, continual booster shots or annual COVID slash flu shots? Like we, we get annual flu shots now. Will that roll out in the future as, as flu and COVID together probably? I've heard some talk of trying to develop such a vaccine. I don't know the answer to that, but what it will speculate, just based on all the stuff we've seen so far, most of the pediatric vaccines come as a schedule, right? A couple doses up front, then another dose maybe in a year, and then another, another dose several years down the road. That's a very predictable way for a vaccine to play out or a vaccine to, to reach its full efficacy. I think that's very likely to be the way COVID vaccines are too. Um, what would what would what would make that not correct is if the COVID continues to um, to mutate at a rate that yesterday's vaccine is no longer effective. We have not yet seen an escape variant of COVID that's also been as contagious to compete with the with the strains that are in the community. But in a sense, we're racing against time to prevent that from occurring. Well, and the, and the information that, that I got when I was looking up about a vaccine that might cover it all, it was very detailed. And it said that when, the, their del when they develop a vaccine that will recognize the trunk of the hemagglutin, it can be done. A vaccine no, with vaccine. Many need for a new one. So if you want to go into, you know, all the chemical things of it, it is possible and they're working on it. This mRNA technology that's been developed for the COVID vaccine uh, is the key to a universal flu uh, vaccine. It's the key to a malaria vaccine, which might be the biggest lifesaver in human history. Uh, and maybe the key to an HIV vaccine as well. So mm -hmm. I think we'll see this mRNA technology yeah. be very useful. Amazing. 
do you and, do you yeah. see or think that people that um, are waiting for treatments and why they're waiting and they'd rather treat it if they get it versus um, take a, a vaccine at this point? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting psychological place to be from, from my point of view, uh, and pretty clearly that's not about safety, right? Because if your concern is safety looking at a vaccine that's been given to 400 million people versus a treatment that's been given to a couple of tens of thousands just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, the treatments that we have available are not very effective. I wish I could say something different. There's a new pill that Merck, uh, the, uh, Britain just licensed it last week. We're probably close behind. That new pill's not that good. We've got these monoclonal antibodies. They're not game changers. You know, they might push 30% of people might prevent 30% of hospitalizations, but they're also in limited supply. You know, we've been looking for cures to common respiratory infections for a hundred years without a lot of success. And this year has not brought about any real big breakthroughs. I hope it does, but we haven't seen it yet. And of course, there's this cottage industry of things like uh, malaria drugs and dewormers being repurposed as treatments for the common cold. There's really, there's not much there, there. On a humorous side, uh -huh. we gained a son-in-law because um, we our grandson is immunocompromised and he's only four years old. And when he was two, my daughter said, well, if you want to be a part of my family, you've got to be up to date on your immunizations. And he goes, okay, where's the list? <laughs> and they'd only been dating like six weeks. Yeah. And then later on, uh, she said, um, do you want to meet my parents? And that was only like after they'd been dating eight weeks because we were living in Utah and we had one week we could meet this kid. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> So a year later, um, they're married and now they're expecting their first baby. So, but he's, this is even before COVID hit, but his willingness to get um, immunized very early in the game so he could be a part of our family was pretty impressive. It was, it was all about love. <laughs> well, well, that's the difference between a positive enforcement and a negative enforcement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, meanwhile, in the advice, in the advice column in the New York Times, every week someone's writing in, they will have a party or a wedding or a birthday party. And some of the relatives are saying, you can't make me get a vaccination just so I can come. So it doesn't always work. It's hard to Well, do we have any other real burning questions right now? We're getting just a little bit after eight and I wanted to, to be able to close. Marilyn has a little praise um, document um, that was written to, to read, but I don't wanna stop some good questions or um that people would have and i think if you wanted to if you did think of something and wanted to put it in the chat i'm going to save the chat as well as we've recorded this conversation so maybe we could ask people and get that information out hey john i got something really quick uh before we kind of wrap up here but um so yeah community engagement with health department we're here to try to help support um our community partners out there um and the faith-based community is a community that we um have kind of got some traction in the past couple of months um, and we're always trying to look forward in new different ways that we can help support, whether that's vaccine clinics, um, whether that's bringing uh, Matt Brignall to your location to have presentations or whatnot, um, bring testing kits to you all. Um, and so we're really trying to find ways that we can work um, with the faith-based community. Um, Associated Ministries, I don't know if you have heard about them, um, they're having a huge push right now of trying to control the narrative um, and trying to create media uh, from pastors by pastors. Um, and if that's something that you are interested to be a part of, um, we really rely on, you know, those faith partners that we have uh, currently um, trying to get the word out um, and kind of creating their own narrative. So um, uh, let me know um, if that's something that you're interested a part of and uh, we can kind of get you uh, connected with the Associated Ministries. 
Well, I did actually have uh, so somebody ask about um, having some of this material for uh, um, a Hispanic community. So in, in Spanish or something, because uh, at least in that community, they are reluctant because of past things, but it would need to be um, in Spanish. Is there stuff like that within the Coleman Pierce County Health Department for those communities? Yes, yeah. yes, there is. And I can uh, definitely put an email together and provide you a lot of different resources. Um, and I know, I don't know if Matt um, is the one teaching this too, but uh, this week, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about the, um, the COVID vaccines and kids presentation? Are you leading that? Yeah, so we're doing a, a presentation. We did one last week and we're doing another one this week on Wednesday night at six o'clock, I believe, with a local pediatrician. Um, and just an open forum for people to ask questions. We're trying to find a doctor to help us do a Spanish version. We don't have that yet, but hopefully within the next week, I think we've, we've got a lead on somebody. We've been doing a lot of outreach into the Hispanic community in Pierce County. Uh, we had a, a really great partner church, the Sacred Heart Church on the east side, helped us do probably 10, as many as 10 vaccine clinics for the Spanish speaking population. And they had the longest lines of any clinics that we did, so. We're working on it. Good. Marilyn, how'd you like to go ahead then and close us with this? This, this was written, am I on? Yeah. This was written uh, early in the pandemic by a woman named Christine Walters Paintney. And it's called Praise Song for the Pandemic. Some of the things have changed a little bit. Uh, but I think what she has to say is still so relevant. Praise be the nurses and doctors, every medical staff bent over flesh to offer care for lives saved and lives lost for showing up either way. Praise for the farmers tilling soil, planting seeds so food can grow, an act of hope if there ever was. Praise be the janitors and garbage collectors, the grocery store clerks, and the truck drivers barreling through long, quiet nights. Give thanks for bus drivers, delivery persons, postal workers, and all those keeping an eye on water, gas, and electricity. Blessings on our leaders, making hard choices for the common good, offering words of assurance. Celebrate the scientists, working a way to understand the things that plagues us, to find an antidote, all the medicine makers, praise be the journalists keeping us informed. Praise be the teachers, finding new ways to educate children from afar and blessings on parents, holding it together for them. Blessed are the elderly and those with weakened immune systems, all those who worry for their health. Praise for those who stay at home to protect them. Blessed are the domestic violence victims on lockdown with abusers the homeless and the refugees. Praise for the poets and artists, the singers and storytellers, all those who nourish with words and sound and color. Blessed are the ministers and therapists of every kind bringing words of comfort. Blessed are the ones whose jobs are lost, who have no savings, who feel fear of the unknown gnawing. Blessed are those in grief, especially who mourn alone. Blessed are those who have passed into the great night. Praise for police and firefighters, paramedics, and all who work to keep us safe. Praise for all the workers and caregivers of every kind. Praise for the sound of notifications, messages from friends reaching across the distance. Give thanks for laughter and kindness. Praise be our four-footed companions with no forethought or anxiety, responding only in love. Praise for the seas and rivers, forests and stones who teach us to endure. Give thanks for your ancestors, for the wars and plagues they endured and survived. Their resilience is in your bones, your blood. Blessed is the water that flows over our hands and the soap that helps keep them clean each time a baptism. Praise every moment of stillness and silence so new voices can be heard. Praise the chance at slowness. Praise be the birds who continue to sing the sky awake each day. 
prays for the primrose poking yellow petals from dark earth. Blessed is the air clearing overhead so one day we can breathe deeply again. And when this is past, may we say that love spread more quickly than any virus ever could. May we say this was not just an ending, but also a place to begin. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. I want to thank all of you for coming and sharing this time and asking questions and responding to questions and bringing your expertise to, to this event. And again, I will make sure it's recorded and posted. So if you want to share it with somebody else to have them listen um, or re-listen yourself, that, that'll be open. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, George. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you.